This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Russell Crowe holds all the cards as he writes, directs, and stars in the high-stakes thriller, Poker Face. Tech billionaire and gambler Jake Foley, played by Russell Crowe, receives the news that he is dying of pancreatic cancer. Aided by his lawyer Sam, played by Daniel McPherson, Jake gathers his childhood friends Michael, played by Liam Hemsworth, Paul, played by Steve Bastoni, Alex, played by Aidan Young, and Drew, played by the RZA, to his house for a game of high-stakes poker, one that will reveal everyone's secrets. But Jake's plans are disrupted when Paul's brother Victor, played by Paul Tassone, leads a group of art thieves to break into Jake's home. Home. Poker Face, not to be confused with the Ryan Johnson series of the same name, is the second film directed by Russell Crowe, who also wrote and stars in it. His first feature was The Water Diviner back in 2014, which he also starred in, and I actually reviewed at the time that it came out, and I thought that was a fairly solid directorial debut. But sadly, Crowe decided that he didn't want to helm any more movies after the passing of his friend, cinematographer Andrew Lesney, back in 2015. Flash forward to 2021, and and Crow's father would pass away, and around that time, Crow was offered Poker Face. And it sounds like, from what I found in an interview about the movie, the producers basically went to Crow as a Hail Mary. They said to him, Oh, we've got this film, the script is an absolute mess, the sets are half built, no one's been cast in it yet, and there are 280 crew members waiting on standby in the middle of a pandemic, hoping that this project doesn't fall through completely. So Crow essentially took it on at the last minute and rewrote the entire script from scratch by himself. So full credit to Crow for actually getting a film made at the end of that because it sounds like it was pretty much going to collapse otherwise if he said no. Unfortunately, it's one of those interview quotes that kind of exactly articulates why Poker Face is exactly the way it is because the whole thing about the scripts being a total mess yeah, Crow didn't really solve that problem. What makes Poker Face so weird as a whole is that there is clearly a discrepancy between the movie that Russell Crowe was asked to make, i.e. a thriller, and the movie that he wanted to make. Because it feels like the opening act of this film, in particular, is Crow working out his own grief. He's using the project as a way of processing his own bereavement. The loss of a parent certainly makes you reevaluate your entire life and makes you realize that you don't last forever. And that is exactly the circumstance that Jake finds himself at the beginning of this movie. The first time we see him, he sat in an art gallery, numb, and still trying to process the terminal diagnosis he's just received and the gravity of it all. This is someone that is extremely rich and wealthy. He has everything at his disposal. He is an extremely lucky man in a lot of ways, but then suddenly all that doesn't really matter anymore. And then suddenly his thoughts become what exactly do I leave behind? What is my legacy as a person? And what do I leave to my family and my friends? And this early section of the movie is where the film is most clearly realised, because as an actor-director confessional, it's fascinating. Crow is working through his own fears of death and his mortality in front of an audience, and it's really raw and almost naked in terms of its emotions. The problem is that the film is, of course, meant to be a thriller, and that was my expectation going into it, and then suddenly we've got this meditative, introspective drama going on at the very top of this film, and that kind of blindsided me a little bit. But you know what? I actually think that if the film stayed on this particular course, if this was the tone it was going to take, it would have been a much better movie. But unfortunately, 
That's not the film Russell was told to make. The fundamental problem with Poker Face is that it feels like three different movies at the same time. In fact, each time the movie changes act, it feels like it changes into a completely different kind of movie from the last. None of it gels together at all. And there's no reason why the film has to feel so incredibly disjointed. In fact, you can kind of see the movie that Crow probably wanted to make. It would probably be best described as Stand By Me meets Rounders. And if you made that as a straight drama, it would work, especially if you were in the hands of a reliable writer. But unfortunately, Russell Crowe rewrote the entire screenplay himself and he is not a script writer. He has never written a movie before and it shows because he does not have a control over tone. This is why the film feels like three different things at once in that suddenly the movie that started out as thoughtful and contemplative suddenly becomes this thriller about a childhood reunion and all of them have brought their secrets that are all dark and ominous and could potentially blow up the entire friendship circle. And then you've got Jake who is being incredibly secretive because he's got his own little plan. He's got a lot of things very much worked out to the smallest detail to try and get these guys to crack and talk about the things that they don't want to see say but they need to get all of these things out into the open because he doesn't have that much time left and i'll say this about crow's direction it is very slick and stylish you've got lots of close-up shots of rolls royce badges and glass walled apartments all the trappings of wealth and luxury lovingly photographed you can see this in an early car chase sequence where all these very competitive friends are given a sports car each to race down to jake's mansion and they just go around through the streets of sydney into oncoming traffic drive driving dangerously and recklessly for really no reason. They say that it's a race, but it's not because there isn't actually any real stakes at the end of it. And so in that way, that kind of encapsulates the running problem in Crow's screenplay in that almost none of the movie actually has any stakes behind it in reality. All the actual tension is purely from the direction itself, which codes it as having this dark, mysterious edge to it. And then you realise that there isn't actually a mystery to it in the grand scheme of things. It's all theatrics. It is all a bluff. Not helping this is to see a frankly bewildering plot point, some of which don't really go anywhere. Chief amongst these is a government super spying program called Riffle. Yes, that's right, it's actually called Riffle. It's so bad that in the narration, Crow's character actually says, I know, it's a terrible name. But why is it called that? Why is it called Riffle, Russell? And this is one of those plot points that makes me think that this was something that was in the earlier draft of the script, and then Crow just kind of kept it there, but didn't really know how to find an actual use for it. Riffle ostensibly is a MacGuffin in the plot, in that this is how Jake has got his billionaire status, in that his friends started out as poker players and they created a poker platform online, and then somehow they used that technology to build a government spying program out of it. Now, I don't know how those skills are so easily transferable, but never Nevertheless, he has been using his own program to spy on his own friends, to try and see their innermost secrets. And again, in a more coherent movie, you could kind of see a way where this would actually make sense, especially if this was trying to be a thriller and that he was trying to maybe blackmail them or trying to force out those things, except it doesn't really go anywhere. Like, yes, they established that he's done this, but the impact of it is very little talked about, nor does it have any real impact on the rest of the movie. It's just something that's just sort of there. You know, it's just like, oh, by the way, I invented a government spy program. Like, 
oh, that's a weird thing to have on the sidelines of your movie, just incidentally. But then again, there's a lot of seemingly important elements in the movie that are just treated like afterthoughts, like the poker itself. You think with a movie called Poker Face, it might actually feature the game front and center, but in reality, there's maybe about 10 minutes in the movie top you get them playing it as teens at the very opening of the film and then about 45 minutes in you get a game of texas hold'em that's your lot in the grand scheme of things it's not exactly rounders or molly's game and again in a better movie you might be able to tie this a lot better to the themes of the film because a game like poker requires you to read people requires you to tell when they're lying when they've got the best hand those kind of skills if you put that into a movie where people are trying to read each other's deceptions yeah that could work you could tie it together with the spying program thing they sort of do but not especially well it's that crow doesn't know how to write the theme in his screenplay so again it feels like another disconnected element and not helping matters is again the card game really doesn't have anything at stake at the end of it yes they put big money on the table but the reality is None of it really matters in the way the film actually plays out. We have to feel some kind of investment in what is going on or what the characters have actually put on the table. But again, Crow makes the critical mistake of either not making those stakes especially clear or negating them almost instantly. In fact, the way the film plays out, it actually has less stakes in hindsight, as you realise they were actually just being fooled the entire time, much like the characters are at the table themselves. And there is a lot of moments where the characters are all sweating profusely at the tension, but it more seems like Crow is just trying to ask the audience to feel that tension rather than actually generating it through the game itself. It doesn't help that these childhood friends are not especially well fleshed out. They're all very archetypal. You've got the wayward friend with a drinking problem. You've got the politician with skeletons in his closet. And you've got an adulterer. All very standard issue stuff. And those aren't spoilers because that's the way the characters are introduced to you when we first meet them as adults at the beginning of this movie. So we know about their secrets right out of the gate but then as if the movie wasn't odd enough already we come to Liam Hemsworth. Now you probably raised an eyebrow when I said that Liam Hemsworth was playing Russell Crowe's childhood friend because Russell Crowe was 57 when he made this movie. That's how old his character is. He actually says so at one point. So that means that Hemsworth is playing someone in his mid-50s when in reality he's 25 years Russell Crowe's junior. So throughout the entire movie, Hemsworth is decked out in this ridiculous old age makeup where they've tried to put crow's feet on him and really draw in his lines, really powdered up his hair with grey and all that, and he just looks absolutely ridiculous. It is so incredibly, laughably unconvincing, and it's just absolutely bewildering. How did this happen? How did Liam Hemsworth end up getting cast as almost being twice his age? Like, there has to be a reason for that. Was the funding contingent on having another internationally known star and that there was suddenly a shortage of internationally known Australian actors in their mid-50s? Was it just that he was the only Australian actor available in the five-week period before shooting? Like, what happened to Guy Pearce or Hugo Weaving or anyone like that that would be way more appropriate for a role like this? The Rizzer is also in this movie as another one of Jake's childhood friends and he's largely in charge of taking care of the Riffle and he only really appears in the movie for about the halfway point but he's barely even there after that. He's largely sat around on the sidelines for a lot of it and it just seems like his presence in the movie is largely because of a 
favour because him and Russell Crowe are very good friends with each other. They worked together previously on The Man with the Iron Fist. And it seems like Crowe basically said, I need to cast this movie very quickly. Can you just pop in for a day or two just to fill out this role in the movie? And the RZA said, sure. And he also said, can you be the music supervisor? Also sure. So the RZA's just sort of there, not really doing much of anything other than just lending his star power to the movie. But let's be clear here, the movie may be ostensibly an ensemble piece, but it's most definitely the Russell Crowe show. He is front and centre through all of this. You can even see this by the way the film is bookended with these huge lumps of voiceover narration. In fact, it doesn't really help Crowe's credentials as a screenwriter that he opens his script with several paragraphs of expository narration, which are really overwritten and flowery. He goes through this metaphor of Newton's law of gravity of bringing his friends back together, which is just really unnecessary. And also, you really should show this instead of telling it over shots of you just driving, which aren't especially interesting. But here's the thing. Crow is decent in the movie. He's solid, but it feels like the way that he has written this character, someone that has invented a huge government spying program and has also been involved in creating an online gambling which has potentially ruined many people's lives, might have shades of grey about him, or the fact that he might be thinking about the ethics of his behaviour overall. But if that is actually in the character, it really doesn't show on screen, because a lot of the time, Crow's just being the nicest man on the face of the planet. He is so generous and so forgiving with his time. He is so wonderful to all of his staff. He is so courteous to absolutely everyone that it comes across as being a bit overly compensatory, given what we know about Crow in real life. It definitely makes him feel like the entire centre of attention the entire time. If feels like the reason that the friend characters haven't been as well written as they should have been is because they might actually take some of the spotlight away from himself. But then the movie goes completely to hell in the third act because suddenly it becomes a home invasion movie. All the stuff we've been building up for about an hour or so suddenly goes completely out of the window and now we've got a group of thieves just bumbling around Jake's pad trying to figure out what painting they're going to steal. And this feels like Crow trying to amp up the thrill element. We've got these antagonizing characters that are going to change the stakes, when in reality it's completely unnecessary. I would have dropped this element in totality, because if you'd written the movie properly, you would have had enough drama and conflict in the friends amongst themselves that you wouldn't have needed a group of extra characters like this to just spring out of the woodwork. And also, having them here adds a whole bunch of extra plot holes and ridiculous choices and decisions. These are thieves so inept they make the wet bandits look like masterminds. They are literally told they shouldn't break into the mansion today because it will be occupied, but they decide that they're going to do it anyway, and so they wander in, they make no attempt to disguise themselves at all, they don't wear masks or anything, even though the place is highly surveillance. In fact, it even has a giant screen with a bank of security monitors showing the rest of the house in the living room, not to mention the fact that Jake is watching them in the panic room, and also, if you were actually stealing all these really high-priced artworks, I think they'd be very easy to track down because they are that recognisable. And it doesn't help that the leader of the thieves is played by Paul Tassone, who comes across in this movie as being like a shop brand Mel Gibson. He's even got the beard and everything, and his performance is absurdly huge. He is absolutely devouring the scenery. In fact, I'm not sure if he's actually going to steal those paintings or just swallow them whole. He's just going to open his mouth up like a snake. He is so huge in his performance that it becomes impossible to take him seriously, let alone be threatened by him. And Crow really should have tried to restrain his performance just maybe a little bit, but instead he's just laughing maniacally and just being really 
really stupid the whole time. And then the movie ends with this climax that not only feels rushed, but also makes you go, is that it? It just makes the film feel incredibly underwhelming, especially as you realise just how slight and flimsy it really is. Poker Face is a movie that exists because it had to be made, not because it should have been, and the script was nowhere near ready to roll in front of cameras. Crow really shouldn't have rewrote the script by himself. He should have given it to someone much more experienced who would have found a way of marshalling his thoughts and ideas into something far more coherent. The movie does have the elements of a good drama, but they're so mishandled or at odds at one another that they just feel like totally different movies. The tone is all over the place. But because Crow wrote it himself, it is a very personal movie, both for good and for ill. And the execution is so strange at times. Again, I point to the casting of Liam Hemsworth as someone twice his age, but instead just looks like he got stranded in the Australian outback for a week. Crow is decent enough as a director, but I think the lesson here is he probably shouldn't write another movie again. You've probably seen this swish thing in the background of the entire video. This is a movie palette. It takes the colour tone of an entire movie and turns it into this artwork. So each of these lines represents a scene or sequences from the entire movie. In this case, this is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you would like a movie palette of your own, then you can go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off your order. And thank Thanks again to Movie Palette for sponsoring this video. If you like this review and you want to support my work, you can give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or with YouTube Super Thanks feature, which is right below the video. Or you can buy some of my merch from my T Public page. Or if you really want to change the odds, you can join my Patreon, where you can see my videos early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out. Mm.